Welcome to the panel, our comedy festivals, the new music festival. My name is Sean L. McCarthy. I'm the founding editor of the comicscomic.com, uh, which is a news site devoted to comedy. I'm joined here today by with Kent Alterman, the president of Comedy Central, and Jonathan Mayers, the uh, co-founder of Superfly Presents, which puts on Bonnaroo and Outside Lands, among other festivals. And last year, these two fellows and their companies joined forces to put on the first annual Colossal Clusterfest Festival in San Francisco. And let's take a look at that before we start talking. So yes, Clusterfest, take that, South by Southwest. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge right at the top, it's, uh, it's, it's quite meta, it's inception like to talk about festivals at a festival. But uh, the truth is that comedy festivals are a rel relatively recent phenomenon here at South by. Uh, they only started incorporating comedy into the program 10 years ago. And back then, uh, that's when I started the comicscomic.com. In, in 2008, there were really only two comedy festivals that the industry cared about, one in Aspen uh, that was sponsored by HBO and one in Montreal, the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. And there were only a handful of other places around the country where you could see a bunch of comedians get together and celebrate comedy. Uh, Jonathan, at what point did uh, did Bonnaroo decide to start incorporating comedy? Yeah, um, we started doing comedy programming at Bonnaroo. Probably was the second or third year, and you know we start with um, doing things that we're interested in and excited by, and so we were always comedy fans, and uh, we just saw how the audience reacted, and it was just, you know was one of our most popular areas. Uh, we saw a lot of cross collaboration between musicians. Uh, and the comics, and we, we just thought that there was an opportunity to, uh, to maybe take a, take a look at it and do something a bit different. Right, I remember one of the first years that Bonnaroo had comedy, you had Chris Rock introducing Metallica? Yeah. Yep, that, uh, Chris uh, did stand up in front of, I think it was like 50, 60,000 people, very brave. Uh, and uh, Metallica introduced a couple of members of the band, introduced Chris and vice versa. And uh, there was just like a really great energy around it. And so we thought this idea of kind of mixing and matching music and comedy that there was really something to it. But at Bonnaroo, isn't really comedy still, uh, for lack of a better term, a uh, circus sideshow element? It's, in a, it's actually in a circus tent. Isn't comedy at, always a circus sideshow, wherever it is? <laughs> I don't <Just> know. <laughs> Uh, for Bonnaroo, music is definitely the core programming component, um, but each festival is different, right? And that's where we thought the opportunity to kind of flip it on its head for Clusterfest, right. leading with comedy, music is a component of that, but we thought that, that that's where there was an exciting thing to do. Now, Kent, with, you've had two tours of duty with Comedy Central. In the beginning, Comedy Central was part of a festival in South Beach, but it wasn't known as the Comedy Central Festival. It was just a comedy festival in South Beach, Miami. And then Comedy Festival got, Comedy Central got involved with New York. Tell me about how Comedy Central's position on presenting comedy in a festival has evolved. Well, the first time I was at Comedy Central that you're referencing, I don't think South Beach or New York Comedy Festivals even existed then. This was back in the 40s. And, um, <laughs> Uh, but the two that you mentioned at the top were, so we would go every year to uh, the Aspen Comedy Festival and Montreal Comedy Festival, and at that time, th it was much more from an industry kind of point of view, so... Right. Uh, Those aren't consumer-fronting festivals. Right. I mean, there's a lot of shows that people go to, but they're very disparate, and um, was well, Montreal. Uh, Aspen was a very sort of almost completely industry driven. So even the audiences were almost completely uh, industry audiences. Uh, the, the South Beach Festival was a little bit more driven by ad sales relationships, like creating a festival for uh, the people in ad sales to bring their clients to. And there were people in, in um, Miami who would maybe be in the audience. But none of them were really the kind of festivals like you know what, what Superfly uh, put together with with Bonnaroo and and outside lands and that's what was attractive to us was the comp you know we we did we got to know uh, John and his his crew from Bonnaroo we we sponsored the comedy tent one year and we had a great experience 
And you live stream shows from there too, didn't you? Uh, I don't know if they were live, but they were definitely in real time. No, I don't. We, we did a mix <laughs> of. Um, uh, I have trouble with time, uh, <laughs> and how it works. But uh, no, we did. We did a special, and we did uh, interstitial piece. You know, short form pieces that we put out digitally. Um, but it was really more about just connecting with what they do. And that's sort of what sowed the seeds uh, for us to collaborate on Clusterfest. And really, the idea was simple. It was like what John, John said, uh, flipping it on its head and making it comedy driven. And it was re it's really the merge of talent and audience and, and, and for fans. So instead of having, uh, say, Montreal, where there's all these venues all over town, and there's no real sense of community, uh, and what we were really impressed with what Superfly it does with their festivals is create a very self-contained world and everyone is in it together and there's no you know it's it, it, it's one one stage to another they're like bumping into each other and there's a lot of uh, cross collaboration and there's a lot of energy that comes from that it's a very different experience than just uh, being in a town and going you know taking an Uber to another place somewhere else right going into a show. Uh, now, as I said, over the last 10 years, there's been quite an explosion, a proliferation of comedy festivals across North America and across the world, such that at this point in 2018, you could have multiple comedy festivals going on the same weekend, which is a testament to how comedy itself has boomed, that there's mm -hmm. enough talent to go around to supply multiple cities and multiple festivals. At what point, did you and the network decide that you needed to have your own stamp on a festival? Well, I think it's a combination of things, but uh, again, even the other references that we talked about, we, ne we were participants, but we never owned it. Right. Here, we've collaborated with Superfly, and we own it together. So it's really ours, and it's our way of really putting you know, sort of our stamp. But ultimately, like I said, it's really connecting our fans with talent. And even though there's a proliferation of, of festivals, uh, I think that between us, we, we've done a good job of sort of accessing all of the different aspects of what a festival can be and talent and curating it in a way that it's beco it becomes very appealing uh, to whoever comes. There's something for everyone. And, the feedback we got from the first year of Clusterfest was mind-blowingly good. We, we tried to brace ourselves for all the things that might go wrong. I remember touring the day before and seeing everything and just having a pit in my stomach about, okay, this venue, there's going to be some shows that's going to have this kind of an audience of half-filled and so on. And, and, and in the end, nothing went wrong. And it was just the, the we did research afterwards and it was glowingly positive for everyone involved, from talent to reps to fans and so on. Um, and I would ask you if I answered your question, but I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we are talking about you know comedy festivals becoming the new thing, whether it's the new music festival, it's the new thing to do is to throw a comedy festival, go to a comedy festival. So with there being so many of them and where comedy is front and center at them, how 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 did you decide to collaborate together, Comedy Central and Superfly? And then how do you pick a city and a location when there's yeah. when there's so many dates and places already taken? Yeah. Uh, well, as Ken said, we uh, started our um, our relationship at Bonnaroo, and so it's starting with getting to know people, right? And do we like these folks? Are we seeing this uh, in the same sort of way? And each brings something different to the table. Um, and so that took some time to develop that. Um, but uh, we chose San Francisco. We do, we have an office there. We also do outside lands there. And comedy has always been a strong component, uh, always done very well in San Francisco. And just the, uh, the spirit of counterculture, too, in San Francisco, I think kind of lent it uh, to doing a comedy uh, focused event. Um, but uh, we start with something and it evolves. Every year, we imagine it will be a little bit different, right? And that's through learning and experiencing it. Um, but I think a festival, whether it's a music festival or a comedy festival, it could be many different things, right? And I think what separates this is um, 
the experiences that we create, the activations, the voice that we're trying to create, the partnership, the location. There's so many different aspects that hopefully will create something a bit different. Right, at, at Clusterfest, I guess the main, uh, the main thrust, main pitch of it is that you flip the script and instead of comedy being secondary, comedy is the main component of the festival, but it's, it's supplemented by uh, big music stars during the day comedy headliners at night, and then you have local chefs. I remember last year in San Francisco, you had a bunch of local restaurateurs who had stations there. And then you also had, uh, and this is, was the first time perhaps I saw this with Comedy Central, you had activations that were with other networks. Yeah. You know, there, was, there was a Seinfeld apartment set that people could tour. There was uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, uh, recreation of the pub. Comedy Central to me has always seemed kind of provincial. So how did you how did you kind of open up the network to these other well, facets? Well, I, I think that uh, while we have a very strong point of view about our comedy and our talent and everything else, we recognize that there's other comedy in the world, and there's you know even talent we collaborate do stuff at other places. Mm -hmm. And so the, the goal wasn't to make it a closed universe. Bec we wanted it to be really expansive, uh, and we wanted to curate the best comedy. So it was kind of a no-brainer that w while it has a lot of Comedy Central stamp on it in uh, specific uh, either talent that we already are working with or uh, historical shows that we've had and so on, uh, we wanted it to really be just the best of comedy across the board. So we were, you know, I don't think it ever was really an issue. It was from the beginning, we always looked at it as let's just make it as good and strong as it can be. And, and Jonathan, you mentioned already doing Outside Lands in San Francisco, but that's in a different part of the city than Clusterfest. Yeah, so that's in Golden Gate Park, and again, a completely different type of festival, uh, mostly music. We do have a small comedy programming component there, but that's what's fun about doing these things is that they're it's not cookie cutter at right. all, right? And this one was very, it was different. And as Kent said, we didn't 100% know what to expect when people uh, first came uh, to the site, but we were so psyched with how people responded to it. And it's nice to kind of try new things. I've been doing the music festival thing for a while, and I think that was what was so exciting about this project was kind of a, a different medium, a different way of presentation. We were using both indoor and outdoor space, and. So it was cool to do something different. Well, what was the thing that surprised you the most about organizing the first Clusterfest? Surprised me the most. Um, I think one of the challenges was communicating as a first year event, like what this was and how this was different. And um, we, were, we were doing some things different. We were asking headlining uh, talent to perform outside. So that was a conversation we were having with them about, hey, trust us. We, we, we think this will work, and it, and it did. Comedians um, always love performing outside. You cannot believe yeah. the skepticism <laughs> that the comedians who even <laughs> agreed to do it. And it was amazing. Like, we had this repeated experience, one after the other, between uh, Kevin Hart and Bill Burr and Jerry Seinfeld, who all did, closed each night of the three days at a big outdoor venue. It, it was almost as if someone had scripted it where they were saying the same things, like, I had no idea this could be so good. And part of that, I think, speaks to what Jonathan said before about San Francisco was such a great place to have it. They really love comedy in San Francisco. And the audiences, even though it was outdoors and it had the vibe of a music festival, people's attention and focus was really there, and the energy was fantastic. Yeah, there was a line for that Seinfeld apartment tour mm -hmm. the entire weekend. But those sorts of activations, like recreating the Seinfeld department, that was really hard to get people to, to understand, right? How do you explain that as you're communicating this new concept? So that, that was one of the challenges, but also one of the big rewards is seeing how people responded to that. Right, whereas the South Park activation, hadn't, hadn't you guys taken the South Park set on a tour before? Uh, we had done a similar thing at uh, Comic-Con with that South Park. Uh, and then we expanded it for Clusterfest. What, what did you learn from, was that something that you learned from Comic-Con? They're like, oh, we could do this, but just more if we had our own festival? Uh, I think it was mostly about just seeing how popular South Park is. It wasn't that we put, put a, a lot of time into changing it so much as, mm -hmm. 
as uh, we just wanted to make sure that it was represented because it's so popular. We had one technical issue at the South Park, uh, little South Park world, um, but it didn't really diminish people's enthusiasm for going into the South Park world. Okay. There's a little, I saw uh, all the moments at uh, Comic-Con in San Diego, and I, I just thought it was so well done that there's so many people that didn't get a chance to see this. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, why not use that, but add, we, we did uh, different vendor fronts. We worked with local restaurants that did their version of uh, South Park restaurants. And so we added to it, but why not bring this stuff out there for others to see it? I think another thing I was just thinking about, you were asking about you know, the proliferation and how comedy has become so much bigger and more popular. Right. And, um, you know, I think part of it is there's reasons why that's the case. You know, I think, well, the first thing I'll say is I think there's nothing less funny than talking about comedy, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, <laughs> you should but, have said that 20 minutes ago. Yeah. But, um, you know, I do think comedy functions in, as such an essential part of civilization, you know, through, through the, all times. You know, it goes back to, you know, the, the court jester was the only one who had permission to speak the truth in front of the king, and it was a valuable uh, role that was played. Otherwise, there's no accountability, right? And I think the best comedy is really rooted in in truthfulness and calling bullshit on hypocrisy and uh, abuse of power or, or whatever. And I think that there's a confluence of, A, the times we're living in have become increasingly weird and complicated and frightening. And so there's a processing thing. Or too simple. Yeah, or too simple, oversimplified. But also, I think it's no accident that all of this is taking place at the same time there's a proliferation of, of social media, digital content, like comedy travels so well digitally. And it's, you know, when I first came back to Comedy Central, our research people do a lot of deep dive into audience and trends and right. comedy and all that. And comedy had replaced music as the most important signifier for someone's identity in the millennial audience, um, where it used to be all about music and rock stars, or they would, you know, when people would think about who would they want to be stuck in an elevator with between their favorite uh, athlete, musician, comedian, or pastor. Uh, the com people p picked <laughs> comedians. Um, Do you have a favorite pastor? Uh, I was always partial to Swaggart. I thought he was very, <laughs> very funny. Uh, he was doing a bit, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, so I think that it's no accident that comedy has proliferated in these times that we're living in, and that that's a lot of why a festival like this is so meaningful, uh, and that people really respond to it. Jonathan, did you find it at all difficult, since Ken could handle all the comedy booking, did you find it all difficult to book musicians for a festival where they're maybe the only people performing that day? It was actually a, a really fun conversation to have with a lot of the agents and managers because there's there's a big proliferation of music festivals and uh, so just a different presentation I think was exciting and uh, uh, just participating in something different. Uh, so we got a lot of buy-in and we really tried to pick musicians that had some sort of connection to comedy. Like we had uh, Ice Cube before uh, Kevin Hart, so that was an example, or Little Dicky that uh, you know, comedy is a part of his his performance. So we kind of looked for and a thread. The, um, uh, Maya Rudolph's band was there. Yeah, we, was, we had a lot Prince of overlap band. of comedy. And also, I just want to say that there was not that division of labor where we booked comedy and they booked music. We really partnered with them and did it. Did it. There was shared vision, I would say, for all of it. Lots of robust conversations, okay. but we were kind of in it together doing all of it. Yeah, and that, that was uh, an example of just how the partnership worked and why it was really, uh, we both brought something to the table. We came from a different... Jonathan brought the most incredible weed, uh, uh, and it was so inspiring. <laughs> this is not being taped. No, no, that's not true. I thought Kent brought it. Well, recreational uh, marijuana is legal in California now, so... True. Right. True. And, and also, I made that up. <laughs> What what did you what <laughs> what did you learn from since last year was the first year for it? What did you learn from undertaking that experience that that you took with you going into year two this year? One of the 
the things that we, we wanted to do this year was really build out the brand voice. Um, we, you know, we're working with all this incredible talent. Um, you know, we make these announcements. Um, how can we get that personality across uh, uh, beyond what's happening over the course of those three days? And thinking about marketing rather than just informational, but also part of the programming. So that, that, that's a big kind of focus of what we're trying to do this year. Are there more things, are you, were you looking to duplicate more things like there was a special event last year where the cast of Broad City uh, read the Wayne's World yeah. screenplay and then you also had Tia Carrera from the original movie reading her part and performing? Definitely. We're, we're more of that kind of uh, specialty, surprise type of programming is definitely a big focus. Uh, so a lot we still have to announce as well. Okay. So, yeah. Because I was going to say... 2018 is the 10th anniversary of Semi-Pro, which Ken Alterman made. Lovely film starring Will Ferrell. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> any, any announcements you want to make about that? Uh, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> we should do a 10-year. Yeah, I should do a 10-year anniversary of that. It's also the 15-year anniversary of Elf. That's also true. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to goad you into, into making a decision to do something, but... Yeah, I am inspired by this conversation. We should get our shit together. I like those ideas. <laughs> Sean's going to jo join our programming yeah. team. I like this. I'd like to announce a new advisory board for <laughs> Clusterfest. Uh, when you're... <laughs> Is it just coincidence that you know you this is the uh, tenth year anniversary of comedians of of um, shit? I just blanked on the name of. Uh, <laughs> you're, you just said your your uh, yeah yours is ten years. Yeah, old my website. Also. Yeah, we we have a shared anniversary. That's 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 sweet. We really need to do this. <laughs> we got to get into it. Uh, Jonathan, if you could just speak briefly about um, whether it's coincidence or just uh, masochism that. Clusterfest is the weekend before Bonnaroo. Yeah, um, that, was an, that was an interesting challenge. Um, but it was a really cool feeling, because Bonnaroo, uh, last year it was year 16. So to go from one weekend of this new concept where you don't totally know how people are going to respond, and then you come out of it, and people, you got affirmation that it worked, and people were excited, and then you come into something that's 16 years, it was a really it was a cool feeling, but uh, I was excited for the weekend after Bonnaroo uh, to be home and chilling. But, but when you were circling dates on the calendar, did you well? It's which you subconsciously right? forget, or did you go, "Oh, I guess I've I've booked myself two big projects." Well, back we wanted to do what was right for Clusterfest, right, mm -hmm. and what was right for that market. And uh, obviously, Bonnaroo's in Tennessee, so they weren't. Uh, in competition uh, with one another, but I, I think it's a testament to our great team that we can operate back-to-back -back weekends, and some of that is, again, like we had been doing that one for 16 years, and it's kind of now we know the rhythm of it, uh, but it was, it was a challenge. But, but I have to say, I, I, it's a good question, because I was blown away by the thought that these guys were going to go do Clusterfest, I mean, to go do Bonnaroo after Clusterfest. I right. couldn't fathom how, how they would do that, and it, it is a testament and to to them and their their ability to sort of harness vision and and commitment to making these experiences so good, they don't miss a beat. You know, it is amazing. How, how do you make sure that they're different experiences? Well, back to you, Sean. That each one of these are unique unto themselves, right? Uh, fortunately and unfortunately, we're not in the cookie cutter business, and so. Uh, you know, venue, the, um, the programming mix, our partners are different uh, depending on the, the project. Um, so we just really, you know, it's, it's, we just like entrench ourselves, whether it's in that particular market or in this case in comedy. I mean, it's been such a fun project for me because now I, I have to go see comedy, which has been really fun and, and learning. And, and I think that's where we start on these things is, again, things that we're interested in and curious about. And that's hopefully where we put out our best work. For people in the audience who may be thinking about starting starting their own festival from scratch, what are what are some of the most common potholes to avoid? Uh, maybe just doing it. No, I um, I th I think it's just 
you know, having a clear vision and a, and a plan, I, I, I don't know it's any different than any other business. It's, you know, it starts off as an idea and then through conversations and meetings and partnerships, allowing that idea to evolve. Um, and then at some point, you know, you can do all the spreadsheets and all the decks and at some point you have to do it. And you learn by doing it and being able to uh, pivot and evolve that idea. But um, I, I think it's, it's fun to try. Kent, since this is kind of the first go around for you, what have you, what have you learned from the first year and a half of planning cluster fests? Hmm. What have I learned? What have I learned? <laughs> um, I'm not always just good at learning, but um, I, I guess uh, I should learn to be less uh, um, superstitious. So, like I said before. I was so convinced that the fr in year one, how would it ever go through without any kinks? And uh, so, of course, the first thing I do when it goes so well is think, oh, now it's going to hit us in year two. But uh, what I've learned is to just keep the faith, because uh, w I think the vision that we have for it is so right on. Uh, you know, I think that, 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 it, that it will prevail. I know just coming to South by for, this is my fifth time at South by, and I, I'm just trying to get in, since I have you two here, but imagining in the heads of, of any festival organizer, how do you top what you do, do the year before? Do you, is that something that's in your, in your minds, or do you try to throw that out and just go, we're just going to put on the best show we can do with who's available? Definitely think about how you top yourself each year and keep growing. And you know, we're driven by the creative, right? And so, how do we make it that much cooler? How do we, um, you know, the attention to detail? Um, that's a constant, and that's why we we do it. And but I think each year we realize, hey, hopefully we get another chance to do it again and learn from it. But it's constant. It, it, it's not. That's one of the challenges and rewards of these projects is they're. They're ever changing and growing, and um, you have to uh, you have to uh, put new life into them. What like Bonnaroo, 16 years later, we got to what? How do we uh, keep it fresh? Um, so that's constant. And I I, I do think that uh, the fact that we that it did go so well in year one emboldens us to even you know maybe take more risk. And then you you also learn small things, you know, like even sort of architecturally, so to speak, planning. You know, there were certain things that we did that we realized, oh, had we put this over here, it, people might have engaged with it in a different way. And, you know, so I think that we can make adjustments like that, expand the footprint a little bit, and make adjustments that make it, that elevate it even more than, than it was. And then it's also about talent. You know, the, the, the best, uh, you know, some of the best currency we had coming out of it was a lot of the buzz that was going around in the talent community. There were people that were very skeptical about how it would work, uh, both in terms of talent and the representation community. And we just heard about it for so long after. People, even people who weren't there, were constantly quoting people who were there. Oh, I heard it was so great. And when comedians are telling each other that, I mean, that gives you a lot more currency, I think, to start building on. Well, in terms of dealing with talent, how? How is dealing with comedian talent at a festival different from dealing with musicians? Color of the uh, M and M's. No. Right? <laughs> uh, it's there's a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, it uh, there's that same community sort of thing where, and it was something that we tried to nurture at our other festivals, where it was a place where artists would want to be at and hang, and I think that was. Uh, a focus of ours to create that that sort of thing at Clusterfest. Um, so I think that really worked in terms of uh, talent wanting to hang there. Um, but in terms of the actual like programming, there there was a lot of similarities. What is what is what does the talent want in terms of creating that atmosphere that they actually want to hang around instead of just staying in their hotel room and doing their gig and then flying out? Well, some of our programming we had things like you mentioned like. Um, the Wayne's World panel. We we had opportunities for talent to do a panel, uh, do their their stand-up performance. You know, so sit in and give them reasons to hang out. Um, and uh, I think just again the festival 
in one central location lent it uh, to this sort of community as opposed to satellite events all throughout throughout a city. So yeah, or even in the, uh, one of the buildings was the Bill Graham Auditorium is in, I don't know what the name of the building is, but it's... Civic like, Center Plaza, I think. Sounds right. Yeah, so Civic Center Plaza is the outdoor area right in front of City Hall, and then uh, the Bill Graham Auditorium is right so adjacent there was an to area it. off of the main stage in there that sort of became de facto green room, and it was a real hangout for comedians all to come to each other's shows. I mean, I think the most important thing was that people had great experiences, uh, and they connected with the audience. That gives them a good feeling, and then they might want to check out their friend and see their show. And and as Jonathan alluded to, the fact that it's all this self-contained, there is there is that sort of festival mindset that's not, it doesn't just feed the fans who are there, but it feeds the talent also. And I think that they don't want to walk away from it. It's exciting and electric and fun and a good chance for them to see each other. Maybe some haven't seen each other for a while. So it becomes a fun hangout for them as well. For as, as far as, as a festival, as a business, for the consumers, how do you create those kind of VIP level experiences that one that people would want to buy into to get those extra wristbands or, or badges and also for the talent to buy in as well? Yeah, um, well VIP or different ticketing offerings are an important part of the business model, right? These are, these are expensive endeavors to take on, so we have to find those sort of revenue sources. But we also want to be, um, I don't know, we want to be thoughtful of how that's presented and not be cheesy or feel like exclusionary. Um, comedy, uh, how we dealt with it was we thought about seating. We, we offered seating as, as a VIP option or reserve seating, that sort of things, or uh, merchandise packages, uh, exclusive stuff like that. Um, but we, we had a very kind of basic first year VIP offering. Um, and then hopefully that's, that's something we'll continue to grow this year. Um, but again, another aspect that we learned, we, we, we tried to keep it simple the first year, um, but I think it's an opportunity to grow. Is that something where there are more opportunities with a comedy festival than with a music festival? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, even our, our music festivals, we have all different sorts of levels and different programs over the years that we've introduced. Um, but we do, we, we do try and think about how do we present this in a, in a, in a tactful way and not feel like a, uh, a person that bought a GA ticket feels like, wow, I got less of an experience because of that. Um, but again, we have to find those sorts of, of revenue streams. One part of the question arc comedy festivals, the new mu music festival, another uh, part of that is music festivals tend to book these big names that get people to come in, and then you end up seeing all these other bands that you've never heard of. How, how does that work with comedy festival? Well, we, we had the same philosophy. Uh, you know, we, tr we, we really wanted to make sure that we curated not just the big headliner, experience, but also a, a sense of discovery for people. So we really tried to mix it up. And that's where I think that, you know, we can lean in with some expertise about there's talent that we're tapped into who maybe aren't as high profile or as, have as much exposure yet, but we know they're at the level of talent they have. And that was another thing that our research kind of bore, bore it, did it, was it borne out? Yes. It was borne out. Um, that people really did come in and we tried to have so many simultaneous experiences on different size scale of, of stages. So, you know, even in, uh, there was the big outdoor, there was a smaller outdoor, or in the civic uh, building, the Bill Graham Auditorium is four to 6,000? 6,000. 6,000. Uh, but then upstairs we had more, we created almost like a comedy club and it was much smaller, more intimate. And so we tried to really be thoughtful about how we programmed so that there was something for everyone. And if someone saw a big show, then they might wander into one of the smaller venues and discover someone that they didn't already know. And I think that was very satisfying for people. Yeah, I think festivals in general lend themselves to discovery, right? You may be pulled in by a big headline or your favorite artist, but you're bound to discover something, uh, something new. And I think that was kind of our positioning of why we thought there should be one central location. Because if it's all satellite events, you're less likely to discover something new. Right. 
So our comedy festival is the new music festival? Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I, we, uh, we believe there's all sorts of exciting live entertainment um, they don't have to be mu mutually exclusive either, I guess, right? But they can know, both you... exist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, for Superfly, we, um, you know, music will continue to be in our DNA, and uh, one of the things that we're we're totally passionate about presenting. But there's lots of forms of entertainment, and really, when we take a step back and think about like why do we do what we do, it's really just. You know, finding commonality, bring people together, you know, a sense of discovery. And so looking to things like comedy to, to kind of hopefully kind of have a new take on it. Well, let's, uh, let's take a quick look at what's coming up this year, and then we'll toss it over to the audience for some questions from you guys. <laughs> so so one, one thing to point out even uh, for this year, uh, the Lonely Island, they all grew up and met in high school in the Bay Area, and yet they have never performed live in the Bay Area. It's their first time, which is kind of inexplicable, yeah, and also it makes it really exciting. Or John Stewart has not performed on the West Coast doing stand-up in, um, I think, nearly two decades. Wow. So uh, we're excited for some of that headliner. Does anybody have any questions in the audience? Yes, in the front row. Uh, yeah, I'm the only one that doesn't know this, but the name Oh, we just wanted to find a word that was descriptive of the way we operate. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty much it, right? Kind of like that. Yeah. Um, well, if it didn't go well, it, we could have just said as advertised. So, um, so it, we're, we're, people were nervous about that. That are we setting ourselves up for ridicule? Like right. if this becomes a colossal fuck up and cluster fuck, have we set ourselves up? But fortunately, we, 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 we had confidence that it wouldn't go that way because we partnered with these guys and we knew how good they were at producing these festivals. So we felt like we, w we walked into it with a certain amount of comfort, you know, that because we knew that the talent we were doing, the place we were doing it, and the fact that these guys were so good at organizing and, you know, creating festival experience, it gave us the confidence that we could call it that. Yeah, and we wanted the personality to come through, starting with the name. If it was the San Francisco Comedy Festival, right, it probably would just be a different thing. And so I think it starts with the name and hopefully leading with trying to be bold and irreverent and hopefully we achieve that. How much do you actually want it to seem like a, a cluster? We don't want it to be a cluster fuck. No? No, but uh, we would like to call it that and it to be the smoothest event and uh, the best operated. So that's what we hope for. But you for. have so much happening in such a oh, small yeah, space. Oh, yeah, in that, that way, yeah, we're OK with it. You mean literally the cluster part? That, yeah. I think, is a really important part of it. Because <laughs> as we said earlier, like there, so, so many of the comedy festivals historically are, they're just so disparate in terms of venues. Right. And they don't have a sense of community where people, in the way you think of like music festivals, have that. I mean, this is the only comedy festival that does that, where there was a crowd of people who were going from one stage to another comparing notes. And so, you know, a lot of the performers w did more than one show. So there could be a lot of uh, sharing of, of experience for people. So someone might say, oh, after you see, you know, this big act over here, make sure to go catch these two comedians in, the, in, in that room. And, you know, I think that was a lot of it. Okay. Yes. Could you stand up, please? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's okay. Stand up. Don't listen to him. <laughs> so most of the work that I do with comedians and musicians is um, working with them to use their platform and their live shows and um, their visual content to support issues and causes that they care about. Um, and I have a few honors, but I don't know if you're doing this, but I'm wondering, you know, partnering with Comedy Central, Daily Show, and like there's been all this political comedy that's been on your network, and so I'm wondering when you create um, a festival like this and you're thinking about the experience of your um, participants, like 
We were thinking that, and then a couple days ago when we, we realized that world peace has gotten here, it became irrelevant. No, the first year, we, we, we tapped in, we made it, we thought of it in a more local way the first year, and you could probably speak to it more, but we, we really uh, focused it more on the neighborhood and the community because we felt this gratitude for them allowing us to come. And, and there were people that were displaced by it too, whether it was homeless people, whatever. so we really tried to lean into the local aspect of it, but we are having some discussions about if we want to broaden it out or not. Yeah, with all of our events, we think about um, what we can do with that vehicle and uh, raise awareness to good causes, raise money. In this case, as Ken said, we work with some local organizations um, that address homelessness, which is a big issue right around in that area. Um, so it is, we, we do uh, have a big aspect of that with all of our events. And, you know, I think the big statement that we're trying to make is, you know, come together, the, the joy and, you know, how can we find commonality? And I think that alone is hopefully a statement without saying anything. Well, you will have two of the three Daily Show hosts this year. That's true. Not Kilborn, though. Also true. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. Uh, was there any other questions? Also, we're going to have, I don't know if people heard about it, but on that note, uh, you know, we created this thing with The Daily Show that started in New York, and then when The Daily Show spent one week in Chicago, we took it there as well. Oh, it's called the Donald J. Trump Presidential Twitter Library, and it's an incredible exhibition of sort of bringing, you know, we thought Trump, every president has a presidential library, but what would his version be? It would just be an amalgamation and a thematic presentation of his Twitter history. It, and so we brought it to life. It's just so well designed. And the White House has said that his Twitter account is our official Part statements. Of the archives. Or the official yeah. record, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. So we're, we, we'll be bringing that to uh, Clusterfest right. this year. So that is sort of a political element in, in this election year. Uh, there was it's, a question on this, this aisle. It, uh, it plays a big role. I mean, every, uh, we have a weekly programming call between Superfly and Comedy Central, and we think about diversity and um, making sure that, you know, all groups are represented and um, how we can make sure that, um, you know, it's inviting to different, different groups of people. Um, but there's just a lot of talent. It doesn't matter, like, you know, we have Amy headlining or Tiffany Haddish, and there's, there's tons of great talent, whether men, women, so hopefully we're, we're really well balanced of how we're presenting it. I know that has been an issue for other festivals, uh, just coming at it from a, from a journalistic point of view, that there have been way too many comedy festivals that have put out their list, and then you look and it's 30 men and two women, uh, is the full comedy lineup, and you have to wonder like how much thought is going into that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I I think our lineup speaks for itself, you know, in year one and in year two. And as as Jonathan said, you know, we try to be mindful of that. And uh, yeah, I think we're in good shape that way. Is there also a mindfulness in terms of how many up and comers who who perhaps this might perhaps be their their biggest break playing Clusterfest might be? versus just getting the, the big names that everybody knows? Um, we don't really think of it in those terms, like are we providing a big break for someone so much as we're, we're really driven by the audience in a way. We want to just deliver the most satisfying, full, rounded experience. So I would say, you know, there's no one that we book that we're wondering, like, are they going to, you know, step it up or not? Mm -hmm. um, so in that regard, even people who have less exposure or less experience, we, we already have a lot of uh, confidence that they have the chops. How much, though, do you think about, uh, since it's in San Francisco, about appealing to that local audience, since they're notoriously picky? 
I think that's that's what I was going to say. It's just about making sure that we have a high level because San Francisco is very, I'd say, analogous to Austin, very sophisticated, true appreciation of good comedy, and so you know that's sort of what we revel in, and so it's really a matter of trying to make sure that we w we would never pander in a way, and mm -hmm. we wouldn't go, oh. We're not that crazy about this person, but they have a big audience. Let's bring them for a commercial reason. We would mm -hmm. never do that. It's always driven by real faith and commitment to what we consider to be great talent. So the fact that Larry the Cable Guy is not playing San Francisco is just a co coincidence? We have not announced our full lineup <laughs> yet. <laughs> Were there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, we, we think about the performers, um, the artists as brand ambassadors. And uh, when we're recruiting, booking talent to come on board, we're also thinking about, hey, beyond your performance, we would like you to participate in our announcement video and um, tweet or post uh, different announcements. And we've gotten great participation from the talent, but really, like, they help spread the word. So that's, that's a key ingredient to our plan. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably an area where in some ways there's as much or more learning that goes into it as we go. I think that's probably an area where we will continue to refine and learn about what is the best way and what's the best timing. And that's what, you know, we defer to these guys a lot because they have so much experience in festivals that we don't. But I think that's an area that we can probably just, we, we will, by nature of the process, we'll continue to learn more and more. Yeah. Do, you, do you find that marketing a comedy festival brand is is different, harder, easier than marketing a music festival? I think it's harder right now because people are less familiar with, oh, a comedy festival? How does that work? Like, how is this different? And um, the best marketing are the people that attend and say, hey, I had a great time, and it's a word of mouth thing, but it is hard to cut through. It, 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 you know, there's a lot vying for people's attention. There's a lot of music festivals. Um, and that's why we're really focused on what makes this different. And uh, that's really important. And again, it's all about the product. How do we make that the best that it can be? And hopefully, that's what's going to really give it legs. Yes, over here. a non-professional camera that's welcome and you can share on YouTube. But I noticed the, I haven't attended very much comedy, but I noticed in those festivals, recording uh, rules seem to be much stricter, and maybe I was wondering why that is, and that might also, you know, make it harder to spread blood about the medium. I don't know if the format is just inherently different, or that that wouldn't have made a difference anyway. Go well, ahead, Kent. I think uh, there's a few different aspects to that question. I mean, I think part of it, there's a lot of comedians who are sensitive to how, the, how their material is shared or not. So when Dave Chappelle, he was the pioneer in this, when he, we, he doesn't matter what venue he's at, he has a security company that, ta that actually physically takes everyone's uh, phones and puts it in a safe, locked uh, package, a pouch, and you don't get it back until you leave. Uh, because that is their currency, uh, you know, their material. I also think that part of what we're interested in and part of the magic of what this festival can be is that it is about people being in a moment of a shared experience. And as soon as you do this or this, you're not, you're not in it, right? And so I think it's also about reinforcing uh, the idea that this is a live, shared, communal experience. And then I also think that um, w as much as social media has been good for comedy and for people sharing and connecting, there's the other side of it too. Uh, this is less about a festival, but you know maybe this isn't where your in question is interested in. But I think that um, I think that s that smartphones can kill good comedy also. And if you think about how how vulnerable a comedian is, especially when they're in comedy clubs, to go and perform. And that is their workshop. And if they have to be worried about 
people, uh, you know, recording and sharing their material even before it's ready, I think that's really damaging to the process of comedy. It's almost like asking a sports team to go play the game but don't practice. You know, that is, that's their practice is, is to be honing their craft in a comedy club. And I think that's been really bad for comedy. Um, so those are all my personal biases about uh, uh, about uh, recording. I, I would just add, I, I wouldn't necessarily consider uh, a festival as practice for the comedian, but I would say that when a comedian is on tour, they're, they're debuting their, their newest hour or half hour of material. And it's not like with your, ba with your favorite band where you can listen to that song over and over again with a comedian, if you hear that, if you see that joke on a YouTube video, by the time they get to your town, it's not gonna have that same effect when you hear them tell that joke. It's also leading to, uh, for established comedians, it's leading to their special. Once their special goes out, they retire that material and they start generating new material. So it is a much different experience and process than in music and to Sean's point about, they don't go and tour and do their greatest hits. It's very rare that they would do that. I think, I think most festivals and Clusterfest may have been the same way last year where they typically allow recording during the first five minutes of a performance. We asked audience to put their phones away uh, in front of the main stage and the Bill Graham. Uh, and that was one of the great things about the audience is they, they listened and they really respected it. And whereas other parts of the festival, like the Seinfeld department or Patty's Pub, that was all about the photo moments. So we kind of had the best of both worlds. For press, though, oh, like for if, you, if you had a, a credential to record, you could still record like the first five minutes or no? By the look on Jonathan's face, I would say Maybe. it's I'm safe right. to say that neither of us is, was aware of that. OK. <laughs> yeah. But it was back to like, how do we create this great environment for comics, right? We're asking some to play outside. It's a different format. And so really, again, we wanted them to come back. And uh, so those were new issues to consider. And I think that was another area where uh, it, w it was a new experience even for audience to go to the main stage and have to give up their phones. Uh, and it turned out to be, I think people actually appreciated it because they could then be liberated from having to worry about posting and shooting and all the rest of it, they were in it. And they absorbed and experienced the comedy, I think, in a more pure, real way. Uh, and they actually, we didn't feel pushback about, uh, you know, collecting phones in the pouches. Anybody else? I don't see any hands. No, there's a hand. Oh, there's a hand? Yeah. Yeah. I'll take this one. Yeah, can you take this one? <laughs> That's it? Okay. Um, no, we, uh, we had a dedicated team to Bonnaroo. We had a dedicated team to Clusterfest. I mean, they're on other sides of the country. Um, and it's all about planning. You know, hopefully uh, with enough advance work and there's plenty of phone calls. Uh, uh, but with that planning, hopefully we're, we do uh, a great job in execution. Uh, but there was there was distinct teams to both of those different events. Kent, did you want to add anything? Add something. I'd like to see what he has to oh, say. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, speaking as someone who does not book musicians, <laughs> let me just say that I think Jonathan should answer this question. <laughs> Okay, um, no, uh, it's a lot of similar stuff. Um, you know, there's the back and forth negotiation. Um, the first year for this one, it was getting in front of a lot of the representation and talking about the event and our vision for it. And um, I think we got a lot of buy-in and, and I think people were excited to do something different um, and that challenge of performing outside. But um, it, it's, a, it's a similar, Exercise. Although I would say for the headliners, it is analogous because they really do plan their touring, you know, pretty far in advance. Yeah. So when did you lock in the headliners for this year? When did we? we started having conversations almost immediately after last year. Um, 
but the first headliner, I think it was early fall, was when we got the first confirmation. Okay, so about nine months yeah. in advance. Yeah, it feels like those conversations are happening all the time. You know, I remember 15 years ago, it was like, oh, wow, we have a window and we have some time off. Now it's like so far in advance. Do you, do you uh, purposely leave a slot open just in case there's a last second availability by someone you never expected to be able to get? Uh, generally, when we do the initial artist announcement, it's, it's probably about 80% of the full lineup. So it allows things like that to happen. A lot of times we're working on things, especially some of the specialty programming, like right. the, 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 uh, what we did with Wayne's World, those take longer. Um, and then we also want to, you know, back to the marketing question, um, we want to have some other moments throughout the campaign, right? That some other hits that are going to keep people engaged and excited and um, so intentionally kind of spread out. All right. Well, we're almost out of time, so before we go, uh, what can you tell the, the fine people here at South By about the future of the festival, whether it's Clusterfest or any, any new festival coming forward? Um, I, you know, f for me, it's going to be continuing to focus on things that are exciting and uh, creative and working with people that we enjoy. And, you know, these things, they are hard and they're uh, bets to a certain extent. But I think when you start choosing things that you're excited about and like-minded people, you know, that's, it, it's fun. And I think keeping that spirit of it being fun is, is, is really important. Great. And I just want to thank you for doing this. We, I do a lot of these panels, and you can tell when people really know and have facility with comedy or not. And Sean has such credibility, and the Comics Comic is such a great 10-year uh, uh, anniversary uh, site. <laughs> and, uh, and it makes all the difference, I think, you know, w when it's not uh, from the outside. It's more from the inside. And thank you so much. And, you made it really great for everyone here, I think. Thanks, and thank you to Kent and Jonathan for joining us, and uh, thank you for being here.